Hey there, my friends. If you're watching this video, it's likely because I told you of a resource or uh, maybe a little bit about my background on how I was able to break into tech sales after spending five plus years, not even in a related industry. And truth be told, it was really humbling because it was extremely difficult to do. I took pay cuts, title drops, everything to strategically position myself to get into tech sales. And part of the reason I had to do that is because, well, tech sales has really bad hiring culture. It's just not going to be conducive for anyone who thinks that they're good at sales to just hop in and start doing the work. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I like to think that tech sales has a purpose behind it where a lot of the industry really genuinely just wants people who are structured and formally trained in the way that tech is typically sold. But most outside of tech industries don't really equip salespeople with these skill sets or strategies. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the basics. I'm gonna give you a few resources in the links below, hopefully so that you can read up a little bit and get a sense of what it's gonna to take to break into the industry. And then as you do your research, you'll actually determine for yourself whether this is something you really wanna do or if it's really just something that you, know, you could probably find doing work elsewhere. But for context, if you're in sales, it's likely because you're chasing money. And as I understand it, the way I see things in the San Francisco Bay Area, I wouldn't call them entry level per se, but uh, let's say the starting first level of sales would typically be the SDR, OBR, MRR, BDR, whatever kind of acronym a company is gonna use. And some form of development rep is going to probably make a base of between 50 to 70K at most but have commissions earnings or a variable potentially up to about, I would say then between 85 and 120K. I don't typically see companies offer up to 120K in variable unless you have a lot of proven tech sales experience, but the potential is you could make six figures in those SDR positions. Although I have to admit, they're really not that common. Most SDR positions realistically are going to translate between 60 and 90K. That I think would be a safer assumption for top performers uh, in the day to day for you know, your everyday SDR gig. When you promote, if you promote or if you transition, probably the more appropriate term, to an account executive, you're basically moving from the SDR position, which is largely cold calling, lead, gen uh, lead nurturing, or if not even lead generation as well and you're moving to a closing role. So the AE is someone who's negotiating, working through deal cycles, and getting that signature on the dotted line. AEs generally are still prospecting. What I like to tell people who get into the industry is that you never stop being an SDR. So if you can't cut it as an SDR, you won't cut it as an AE necessarily. It's just a good rule of thumb to consider. It's not always the case, admittedly. So if you're an AE, you're spending a lot of time hosting demos and figuring out the relationship, the buying, uh, I guess the buying journey that the customer needs to be walking and guide them through that to get a close. I don't wanna to get too much more theoretical than that, but it's important you know that you generally have to start as an SDR because the skills of an SDR are expected as the, let's say the tasks that an AE has to do. And so if you don't have SDR experience, it's really, really difficult for a company to justify hiring an AE straight out if they don't come from tech sales or can't talk the talk. And so for the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk you through what that talk is. First thing, if you haven't read it, I highly encourage you read the book called Predictable Revenue. I believe the author's name is Aaron Ross. Uh, pardon the cat in the background there. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna step over here. Uh, the, the Predictable Revenue book is written by a former Salesforce leader who basically, well, frankly, literally wrote the book on how the SDR and account executive relationship transforms tech sales. And I really say transform, it, it probably means more accurately modernizes because the principle existed long before in the IBM days even. But Salesforce effectively grandfathered what is now coined as the Predictable Revenue Model which is basically the tech sales process that most tech companies follow now, regardless of whether they even know where this all came from. And this is how it works. Generally, you have leads coming in through advertising and marketing. We're not touching that side of, of the business yet. But leads are coming in through advertising and marketing, and then a company has to answer the question, do we need full deal cycle reps who basically as AEs start with that lead nurturing and move them through conversion to a sale? Or, hey cat, 
or um, do we split that role up? Do we have an SDR start with that lead nurturing and then move the AE to just focus on the back end of that, which is closing a lead who is actually interested and potentially buying? So what that means for you as an SDR is you have to follow this process of nurturing leads, and that's what we're gonna spend these minutes talking about. So as an SDR, you basically have that lead come in, and ideally you're in an inbound scenario. That's usually where you start, at the like entry most level of it being an SDR. A lead's gonna come in, you're gonna follow up with an email. Here's the thing though, you have to be familiar with a CRM, because everything's gonna be integrated with a CRM. That's your Salesforce, your Zoho, your Microsoft Dynamics, whatever CRM someone uses. What's that other popular one? Freshworks is, is up and coming in the Bay Area right now. HubSpot, HubSpot's a really popular one too. <clears throat> Excuse me, so uh, when a lead comes into the CRM, you, uh, you're notified by email, you log into your CRM, you check their contact information, you call straight up, you shoot them an email, and then you do what's called, well, it doesn't have a term, but you end, put them into a cadence or a sequence. They usually use another software on top of the CRM called, um, actually I don't know what the software is called, but the two big ones are outreach.io and salesloft.com. They're both great tools. Honestly, like they're both exactly the same unless like, I'm sure there's better value propositions I'm not aware of, but practically speaking as a sales rep, they know, or they both do exactly the same thing. Um, Outreach.io has better thought leadership, but I think Salesloft has better research. Um, there are a lot more documented research papers you can read, but who does that? And Outreach does a lot better with their leadership, building a brand on LinkedIn and having consumable videos, and it's great. And I tell you all this because that's a hint. Go on LinkedIn, follow the, the salespeople and thought leaders from Outreach, Salesloft, and even Gong. That's another tool I won't talk about right now. Um, they all have great sales training, uh, like free because they just post a lot of content on LinkedIn. Their brand is great. So when a lead comes into your CRM, back to the process, sorry, there's a lot to, to cover. When a lead goes into your CRM, you need to be familiar with a CRM. If the lead, when the lead enters your CRM, you typically move them into your cadence or your sequence in one of those software, Salesloft or Outreach. That software organizes your leads and you basically, your manager would likely have done this for you, but it basically sets up this cadence of touching base with them across all channels of communication. And it's great because it effectively creates like a call list. So when you start the application at the start of your day, you see a whole list of names with their phone numbers, their emails, everything that was already captured in your CRM database and you just go through that list and it'll automatically track. Like day one, you're gonna call and then send a follow-up email. If you didn't catch them on the phone, you sent them the email. You're gonna give them a day or two, then by day three, you're gonna send a follow-up email, just checking in, did you get this? Uh, maybe call but not leave a voicemail. All these different rules and nuances. Um, and then the third, by the, your third effort would likely have been like a LinkedIn outreach or follow or message or connection request or something. And so all of this is organized in that platform so that once you log in, you just go through the list on all your, your contacts for that day. And this kid, sorry guys. Um, you go through that list and by the end of the day, you should have at least been able to make like anywhere between 70 to 90 dials is typically like a target uh, dialing uh, amount. After that, hopefully you'll have at least tried to connect with one or two people like live. Uh, or even have scheduled from weeks past of all your, your outreach efforts. And your goal as an SDR is to get them, is to understand what their, uh, what their interest is, why they reached out, and ultimately if they're even interested in taking a meeting to learn more. Because they came in in the first place, we're trying to figure out if they're working on a project, just curious, or whatever. And that's an SDR's job. It's some form of warm calling, if not cold calling, and what goes beyond all that is that's like the easiest job. Uh, at least that's the easiest description of the job. It's really hard to do because the reality is the true top performers of SDRs go steps further. When those leads come in, they'll then go on LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get heavy on the, the research, go deep into that uh, discovery of 
who certain decision makers are at a company, they'll build more contacts off of just the one that came in. Because just because one came in, you don't reply and walk away. You research that individual, see if they might actually be a realistic person to even reach out to. Then you use LinkedIn and their information to kind of figure out who the other people are. You use other tools like Zoom Info or Seamless.io, which are apps that help you find people's cell phone numbers and emails at, at companies. So when you're doing your research, you can find out, hey, so-and-so reached out to our company, but they're only an individual contributor. Let's see if we can find a VP from their department that we can call on and maybe actually learn a little bit more about what they're trying to accomplish. That way, you really fill your day building up enough of a list with tons of people to call to keep you busy day in and day out, making 70-ish dials a day. Some people get away with only 30, 40 dials if they're better quality, right? If your output's the same, most SDR managers will appreciate that. But the beauty of sales is that it's always a numbers game. So if you aren't hitting your numbers, you just gotta rack up or stack up on your efforts and, and get higher numbers to improve your output. Uh, at least until you can figure out what efficiency will bring your effort, so to speak, down, but then you know still produce an, uh, an efficient output of like your, your KPIs, your key performance indicators being number of dials, number of emails, or number of meetings, or you know number of qualified leads, things of that nature. So again, an SDR is the best place to start in the tech industry. Uh, humble yourself the best you can uh, when it comes to title and pay because moving straight into tech as an AE is extremely difficult. Not even I was able to do it with, you know, even having a title like Enterprise AE, which is effectively one of the higher uh, like titles you can have as a salesperson uh, within a segment, if you will. And I had like five, six years of, uh, you know, B2B uh, proven experience and, and none of it would let me get in as an AE. That's not entirely true, by the way. There was one company that was willing to, to give it a shot, but they were a startup. I, frankly, I didn't believe in my growth opportunity there. And that's the kind of thing that would help you get to be an AE with, while skipping the SDR role. You'd really just simply have to go to a startup or find a young company that's tech-based or SaaS, subscription product software type of model. And, or, and, and you know that'd be your best way to kind of skip a step. But why skip a step in the end? I mean, if they're gonna pay the same as they would an SDR, just be, or if an AE position is gonna pay the same as an SDR, because that's likely what would happen. I mean, why not just go for a bigger company with a proven process that's gonna equip you and train you well as an SDR? Might actually consider promoting you within a year, and then after that, I mean, you can do whatever you want at that point because you'll be an AE, and then I don't know, sky's the limit, huh? <laughs> All right, that's about it for now. It's the best advice I can give in a nutshell. Sorry it was a long video, but I, I think everything I, I shared was just like raw, uh, pure advice. You're just gonna have to put in the work. Like I said, uh, follow the process in the comments or where, whatever description this video ends up on. Follow those resources and I assure you, you will build the ideas. You'll put in work on what it takes to understand or become an SDR. And then as you apply, um, hopefully you'll you'll find yourself in more in a more informed position to be able to set yourself up well to get a job, or um, really just understanding to what the job is to be able to nail that interview, and um, and when you get the job, like know that it's the job you you really want to try and get into. Most people try to get into tech sales for the money, and yes, it's possible, um, but it, it obviously. It's not easy. It doesn't come without work. And frankly, as I've learned too, if you don't come from tech sales already, it is a different kind of sale. It's ridiculous how wide the gap is or how much of a bridge you have to build just to get there. But the reality is the potential earnings on this uh, technology side really are greater than that of most product business um, that I've been in. You, and by what I mean by that is by the pace of growth. For me to make two, three hundred thousand in other industries would have taken me fifteen years, twenty years to get there. I see people making two hundred thousand, you know, within five to ten years um, when they're top performing AEs at really good tech companies. So uh, the scale is just a lot faster. Anyway, I'm coming up on fifteen minutes. That's plenty enough now. I'm gonna let you go. Um, but thanks for watching and good luck. Let me know if you need any help.